2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning at verse 14, reading through verse 19. And the word of the Lord today from the King James text reads, Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Amen. I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic, Approved. If you bow your heads with me one more moment, let's go to the Lord once again in prayer. Master, Savior, soon coming King, we love you, Lord, so very much. We love the Word of God. We love today, O oh God, that you have given us a written transcript from which we are able to glean not only life lessons, not only wisdom, but Lord, we're able to find truth that is able to set the soul of man free. Master, today the preacher acknowledges as always that I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost if I'm to be effective, if I'm to do the work that you've called me to do. I must humble myself in your presence and yield myself to that great anointing. Pour out the oil and the wine. Even now, Lord, not only upon me as the speaker, but also on those today that are listening, those who will listen later by reason of the Internet. Let the anointing flow today, O oh God, like a mighty river. Break the bondage of tradition. Break the bondage of false belief and false doctrine. That we might walk in the liberty of the Holy Ghost. For we ask it today, Master, in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God. Amen. I'm going to have to stay behind the pulpit probably for the entire message today. Those of you who know me well know I have a habit of wandering around a little bit and, and talking and sharing some things. I can't really do that today because I have a lot of material to cover and I don't want to take a lot of your time. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, the Apostle Paul admonishes his young apprentice, as it were, Timothy, to study to show himself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing, rightly dividing the word of truth. I've spoken often of the importance of understanding that the Bible was not given to us in English. It certainly was not given to us in the King's English. And if you're really going to understand what the writers are saying, it is imperative sometimes that you go back and look at the original uh, language, look at the literal translation of some of these words so that you can better understand what is being said. We read the word approved. He said, study to show thyself approved unto God. 
Now, there's not very many of us that don't like approval. Amen. I'm going to tell you, uh, preaching this message today, I'm not likely to get it from most fundamentalists and most evangelicals. I don't care. I want to be approved of God. I want to have rightly divided the Word of God and transmitted the right information, the truth to God's people so that I have God's approval and whether or not I have man's approval means precious little if anything to me whatsoever. I'm going to tell you if there's anything that coming out and, and entering into affirming ministry, if there's anything that this has done for me, it has freed me from the tendency to seek men's approval. Mm -hmm. It has freed me from trying to go along with tradition and go along with what is uh, has become the orthodox beliefs within the evangelical movement. I've been freed from that. You know why? Because I know that because of who I am, it don't matter what I preach or what I say. I'm not going to get their approval no kind of way. So you know what? I'd be foolish and stupid to uh, constantly try to earn their approval and seek their approval by preaching things that I know they're going to agree with and they're going to like. No. I'm going to tell you something, folks. Sometimes God uses circumstances in our lives to free us from some things. And He has used who I am to free me from any need to be approved of men. I have been freed of that. And for that reason, I'm going to preach the truth today, whether evangelicals and fundamentalists like it or not. The term approved, as we read it in our primary text today, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, comes from the Greek word doki, uh, dokimos. It means to be accepted, now listen, particularly of coins, and money. Say, huh? Well, that kind of changes things, doesn't it? Why would Paul say, study to show thyself approved unto God? And the term approved he's using literally speaks of coins and money being acceptable or accepted or pleasing. In the ancient world, see, you've got to understand context. You know how many times I've talked about you've got to understand context. In the ancient world, there was no banking systems. They had no paper money. All currency was made from metal. It was heated and liquefied. It was poured into molds, and then it was allowed to cool. When the coins were cooled, it was necessary to smooth off the uneven edges around the outside of the coin. The coins were comparatively soft, and many people shaved them closely. In one century, more than 80 laws were passed in Athens, Greece alone to stop the practice of shaving down the coins that were then in circulation. But some money changers were men of great integrity who would accept no counterfeit money. They would not accept shaved money. They were men of honor who... Uh, required that each coin properly weigh exactly what that coin was meant to weigh. Such men were called dokimos, or approved. Ah, all of a sudden now we see Paul is using something within Greek culture 
to illustrate. Do you see why I say it's so important to understand context? It's so important not to just take a word and, you know, and, and apply it according to our current definitions and our current understanding. No, Paul is saying, in a sense, he's saying, there are those who handle the Word of God carelessly. They shave it. They take a little off here and a little off there to kind of make it fit their thinking and their theology. There are people, they would shave a little bit of that precious metal because they could later then take all those shavings and they could create whole new coins out of those shavings. So if you can get two or three pennies out of each dollar, then after a while you're going to have dollars, aren't you? Amen. That's what the practice was. But Paul is saying that like the men who required that every coin be properly weighed and weigh what it ought to weigh, that integrity be applied. He said, this is what God wants from you. When does he want it? He wants it as you study to show yourself approved. He wants you in your study of Scripture. He wants you to require that everything be properly, truthfully, accurately interpreted and understood. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, don't just take things that... Don't just because some preacher got up and preached you into hell, LGBT person. Don't you believe that? <laughs> I got news for you. Some of us have taken the time to do the research. Some of us have taken the time to look again at these issues. Some of us have taken the time to look into the Hebrew, to look into the Greek, to gain a better, clearer, more accurate understanding of what God's Word says on these issues. And there are many people who are going to wind up in a devil's hell, lost for eternity, not because they had to, but because they sat under a man, a woman, a preacher, who did not show themselves approved unto God. They did not require that the proper weight. They did not require that it be what it is and be what it's supposed to be. In this passage, the Apostle Paul uses a term which specifically speaks of one who honestly and with integrity handled money in ancient times. So it is true of us today, those who handle the Word of God honestly and with integrity are to be considered by God approved. Hallelujah. Sadly, there is so much mishandling of God's Word that takes place because its handlers choose to embrace certain beliefs before they even have read a word. There are many, many. I'm going to tell you, if there's a, I grew up in the fundamentalist movement. I'm going to tell you, there are certain things you're taught to believe. And you go into your study of scripture. And every word you read is tainted by the fact that you're told first, this is what you must believe. Let me tell you, if you're going to be counted as a fundamentalist, there are certain things that fundamentalism requires. There are certain doctrines and belief. One, you have to be Trinity. Two, you have to believe that the Word of God is verbally inspired. Nowhere does the Bible say that the Word of God, the Scriptures, were verbally inspired. But if you go to any Baptist or any fundamentalist website and you look at their statement of faith, they're going to say, we believe the Word of God is verbally inspired of God. Okay, where do you get that from? And then they'll pull various passages out of the, the Bible that they'll try to use to support that notion. But let, let's look at that a little further. One of the most blatant mishandlings and abuses in the handling of God's Word can be found in the way 
that one single word is presented and defined, and that word is Scripture. Most Christians have been led to believe that the word Scripture speaks of the entire Bible as we know it today, all 66 books of the Protestant New Testament, but it does not. 2 Peter 1, 20 and verse 21. Knowing this first, Peter writes, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. He didn't say they spake as they were dictated to by the Holy Ghost. As the Spirit spoke, they then spoke. That's not what they, he said. He said they prophesied as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You follow what I'm telling you now? He also said that the prophecies of Scripture... Every time you read the word scripture or scriptures in the New Testament, every single time, the writer is referring to what we would call today the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Every single time. Time. I challenge you, I don't have enough time because there are over 50 passages where the word scripture or scriptures is employed. But I challenge you, get you a concordance and look up the word scripture or scriptures. Uh, get you a go to BibleGateway.com and put in the word scripture or scriptures in the, um, in the King James text and then look at every single passage that comes up with that word in it and read it and tell me that they are not speaking of the Old Testament. Of course they were. Because when the writers penned these words, when the speaker spoke those words, there was only one canon that existed at that time that was called the Scriptures. That canon was the Old Testament. It was the Law of Moses. It was the prophets, both the major and the minor. It was the books of wisdom. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. It was uh, the historical books. Those are the only scriptures that existed in the New Testament era. So when you see a reference to the scriptures, they are always, always referring to the Old Testament. When the Apostle Paul says to Timothy to rightly divide the Word of God, I got news for you, honey. The New Testament did not even exist as Timothy was reading these words. And the New Testament certainly had not yet been married to the Old Testament and printed with a nice leather binder. No! All Timothy had at that time that would be called the Word of God was the Scriptures, meaning the Old Testament. In Romans chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul writes, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So obviously he's referring to past. He's referring to a document that already exists. Clearly here Paul states that prophecies found in the scripture were given as holy men of old were moved upon by the Holy Ghost. The scriptures were written, Peter says, in days of old. All references in the New Testament to Scripture speaks of the Hebrew canon, what we call today the Old Testament. Every 
every single New Testament reference to Scripture or Scriptures is speaking of the Old Testament. Luke chapter 24, verses 26 and 27, Jesus is speaking. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all of the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things pertaining to concerning himself. This is after his resurrection. In Luke 24, go down to verses 44 and 45. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were lit, written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. What were the scriptures? They were the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms according to Jesus himself. Now some of you are saying, Pastor, I appreciate what you're saying, but I don't see where it makes a whole lot of difference. It does make a difference. Listen. In 2 Timothy 3, 13 through 17. But evil men and seducers, Paul writes, shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. How could Timothy have known the Holy Scriptures from a child if the New Testament hadn't even been written yet? Obviously, the Scriptures Paul's referring to do not include Matthew through Revelation. But then listen, he goes on to say, he said, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Listen, verse 16, chapter 3, 2 Timothy. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It does not say all scripture is given by verbal decree from God. It does not say that God dictated all scripture. It said all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Dishonest theologians and dishonest preachers have tried to ascribe to the New Testament attributes which are not truthfully possessed by the New Testament writings. Those attributes which are ascribed to the scriptures. In other words, you go to First Baptist Church and they're going to tell you all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Hallelujah. And that includes Matthew through Revelation. Uh -uh. Paul wasn't talking about Matthew through Revelation. Matthew through Revelation hadn't even been written yet. Am I telling the truth? No. So what Paul is speaking of here is applicable applicable to the Old Testament scriptures. But they'll try to throw in the New Testament and they will try to make you believe that every word you, you read in the Bible about scripture is applicable to the New Testament as well as the Old. New Testament was not created in the same way the Old Testament was created. The New Testament and the Old Testament are very, very, very different uh, texts, very different books. But listen, 
by haphazardly throwing both the Old and New Testament writings together. They then try to make uh, as immutable, absolute, and uncompromisable doctrine the fundamental position that the whole of the Protestant Bible is written in their words verbally inspired by God. Now nowhere do we read that it's verbally inspired, number one. But they'll tell you that's what it means when it says all scripture is given by inspiration. That means it's verbally inspired. It's verbally given. That is not what it says. Am I telling the truth? Then they'll try to throw in the New Testament writings with the Old Testament writing and tell you, but this is all to us. We understand that the New Testament qualifies every bit as much as Scripture as the Old Testament does. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Because the Old Testament was written under a different anointing. The Old Testament was written under a different purpose with a different, uh, for different reasons. The Old Testament was given to us in a different way. The New Testament possesses the authority that God gave the apostles to establish the church. Therefore, the Old Testament was given to us by inspiration. The New Testament is given to us by authority. No one has the authority to change the doctrine of the church. No one has the authority to override what the apostles taught us. No one. And I'm going to get into that in a moment. But nowhere in the writings of the apostles who wrote for the purpose of teaching, instructing and clarifying sound doctrine for the first century churches, nowhere in their writings do the apostles make any claims of verbal inspiration. Not once does the apostle begin his letter, his epistle, by saying, The Holy Ghost of God is upon me, and every word is from God. He never says that. He is writing a letter. He is writing instruction. He is writing teaching. He is writing to clarify. Now in fact there are instances in which the Apostle Paul stated clearly listen, that he was writing using his word by permission and not by commandment of the Holy Ghost. So this statement alone completely blows out of the water the fundamentalist claim that all of the Protestant Bible was verbally inspired or dictated, as it were, by the Holy Ghost. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 5 through 7, Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Listen, but I speak this by permission, and not of commandment. Well, wait a minute, Paul. Every word you wrote, every word of the Bible is... God verbally speaking it through you. No, Paul said no. He said, when I'm writing right now, he said, I'm not writing this because I feel like God has somehow commanded me to write this. He said, I'm writing this by permission, meaning that the Lord simply allowing me to state my opinion on this issue. Do you follow? That's all Paul said. Why is this important? Because understanding the unique role played by the scriptures helps believers to know why a clear understanding of scripture is invaluable to the born-again child of God. The issue here is intellectual dishonesty. How can our theology be right 
if we begin with a false premise. How can we be judged by God to be approved when we carelessly handle the Word of God? Notice I use the term the Word of God. Do I believe that the writing of the apostles is the Word of God? Absolutely. Yep, it's the Word of God. Is it Scripture? No, it is not. So when you read the word Scripture in the New Testament, does it apply to the New Testament? No, it does not. It applies to the Old Testament. But does that take away the fact that the New Testament writings are the Word of God? What does the Word of God mean? It's very simple. It means a word from God. Did the apostles write a word from God for the churches. Absolutely. When a preacher gets in the pulpit, he's supposed to preach the word. Paul told Timothy, preach the word. What's the word? It means a word from God. Not your own opinion, not your own thoughts, not your own feelings. Am I telling the truth? When the apostles sat down and wrote their epistles, they basically were putting a sermon or a teaching on paper. Therefore, it is, in fact, the Word of God. But the apostles had something that you and I do not have. They had apostolic authority, meaning Jesus gave them specific authority to establish the foundation of the church. A foundation cannot be altered. When you build a building on a foundation, you cannot go in later and change the foundation. No, the, the, the Apostle Paul said, there's one foundation that's already been laid. It's laid, it's down, it's cement, it's stone, it's solid, it's established. Did I tell the truth? What is that foundation? He said, the Apostles and the Prophets. Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone. Let's continue. So understanding what Scripture really means helps us to understand the role that the Scriptures play in the life of born-again believers. A clear understanding of Scripture helps us to know that the Scriptures help us to know who Jesus Christ is in truth. John 5, 37 through 39. And the Father, Jesus said, himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you. For whom he hath sent him, Ye believe not. Listen to what Jesus now says. Search the scriptures. For in them ye think ye have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. So Jesus is speaking to scribes and Pharisees and Jews. And he says to them, you don't listen to God. You don't listen to the voice of God. You don't pay any attention to what God has to say. He said, I'm going to tell you a little secret. If you'll search the scriptures, what are the scriptures? The Old Testament. The Old Testament. He said, search the scriptures. These are they which testify of me. Oh my goodness. So Jesus is saying, if you want to know who I am, search the scriptures because the scriptures are given to do what? To tell you who I am. Oh my goodness. Now we've got some people who believe, oh no, no, the Old Testament was given to tell us all about Jehovah God. And Jesus didn't even show up on the scene until Matthew 1 and 1. Oh no, 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 honey. <laughs> See, that's where your mistake can happen. <laughs> yeah. Oh, if you want to know who Jesus Christ is in truth, I got news for you. The Old Testament will tell you. It'll tell you. It'll tell you. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the 
the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. David said, The Lord hath sworn unto his servant David, and he will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body shall I sit in thy throne. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you, honey. You search the scriptures and you're going to find out that Jesus is the subject of every single passage. And this is why it's so important to understand when the word of God speaks of scriptures, it's speaking of the Old Testament. Because there are things that we glean from the use of the Old Testament that we are not going to get in the New Testament alone. For instance, the Old Testament helps us to understand the hopeless state of mankind under the weight of sin. Understanding the law helps us to better understand why we need a Savior. Without a Savior, we have no hope of salvation whatsoever. And it is through understanding the scriptures that we know this. Romans 8, 2 through 4, the Apostle Paul writes, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death, meaning the Old Testament law, for what the law could not do, could not do. He didn't say what the law could do, but it took longer. What the law could do, but it was much harder. No, 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 no. He said, for what the law could not do. In that, it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So understanding what Scripture is, we understand better that without a Savior we are hopelessly lost. That's what the Scriptures will teach us. Knowing the Scriptures helps to cement in our mind and in our spirit, the body of prophetic fulfillment found in Jesus Christ, thus cementing his identity as the long-promised Messiah. I'm going to tell you something. If you ever want to be convinced Jesus is the Messiah, look at the Old Testament. Look at everything God prophesied of the Messiah in the Old Testament. Do you follow what I'm telling you? Honey, you will walk away with a deeper, more certain conviction that Jesus is the Messiah that was promised throughout the Old Testament. You will walk away with a conviction that He is indeed the Messiah. How do you do that? You can't do that by reading the New Testament. You've got to understand the Old. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? So the scriptures, the Old Testament, given to us by inspiration of God, which is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Notice Paul never one time said for salvation. Nope. Because the salvation message is not found in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. It's an instruction in righteousness that scripture is given to us uh, by inspiration and profit for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness. He never once said a thing about redemption or salvation. Why? Because that message is found in Jesus Christ. That is the message of the New Testament. But we still, by use of the scriptures, are able to establish sound doctrine, sound beliefs. Am I telling the truth? Yes, sir. Amen. So knowing the scripture helps us 
to develop a conviction in, in the, the knowledge that Jesus Christ is the long promised Messiah. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, the Apostle Paul writes, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, listen, according to the Scriptures. So he's pointing back and saying, the Scriptures tell us that he would do this, and he did, according to the Scriptures. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Dozens of times within the New Testament, we read quotations of Old Testament prophecy concerning Messiah as a means of helping to establish and support the messianic identity of Jesus Christ. In Mark 1 and 2, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. In Mark 9, 13, But I say unto you that Elias is indeed come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed as it was written of him. Do you see? He's pointing back to the scriptures. He says, if you look in the scriptures, it says that this is how John the Baptist would be treated. Mark 14, 21. The Son of Man indeed goeth as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Good were it for that man if he had never been born. So you see, Jesus again is pointing back. This is all written. This is all in the scriptures. All of this is in the scriptures. John chapter 12, verses 13 through 15, talking about what we refer to today as Good Friday, the triumphant entry of the Lord into Jerusalem prior to his crucifixion. And they took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna! Blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon as it is written. And then we read a quote of what is written. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. Do you see how there's constant reference back to the scriptures, back to the scriptures? So obviously, if you understand the scriptures, if you search the scriptures, you're going to better understand Jesus' messianic identity. You're going to better understand Jesus' divine identity. Am I telling the truth? Knowing the scriptures also helps us to ensure sound doctrine. In Matthew 22, verses 28 through 30. Therefore is the resurrection, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? A man comes to Jesus and says, okay, so uh, a man's married to a woman, he dies. His brother marries her, he dies. His brother marries her, he dies. The next brother marries her, he dies. He, she'd been with seven men, all of them brothers. And this man says to the Lord, because he doesn't believe in the resurrection, he's trying to discount the resurrection. He says, therefore in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures. So what's he say? He say, your doctrine's off. Why? Because you don't understand the Scripture. If you knew the Scriptures, then this question wouldn't even be asked. He said, ye do err not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry, nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. 
One of the most cardinal false doctrines within the Mormon cult can be dispelled by this one singular passage. Marriages are not, as the Mormons put it, quote, sealed for time and eternity, end quote. That's something Mormonism teaches. Their people go to the temple and participate in this ritual. And their marriage is sealed for time and eternity. So when that Mormon man dies and becomes a god and is sitting over his own world, this woman is sealed to him for time and eternity. And she'll be his little goddess. And they'll have little spirit babies. And they'll populate that world with their spirit babies. I know it sounds asinine and ridiculous. This is exactly what Mormonism teaches, folks. I'm not making a, jo a joke. It is a joke, but this is what they teach. Yet Jesus made it clear, if you understood the scriptures. So now Mormons try to tell us that the Bible is not altogether accurate. It's not accurately translated. But it's in the Old Testament, not the New Testament, that Jesus said you can find the truth about the resurrection that you'll understand in the resurrection they're neither married nor given in marriage. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? Okay. So, how often do we read of the Lord answering a question with the words, what do the scriptures say on this matter? The answer is already there, he implies. You just have to have done the work to find it. Am I telling the truth? Amen. Understanding the role of the scriptures in our faith is important. This is why so much of our preaching comes from the Old Testament. There is so much to be gleaned from a clear and balanced understanding of the scriptures. The authority of the New Testament is indisputable. But the foundation of our faith is found in the God-inspired scriptures. Mm -hmm. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Ephesians 3, 1 through 7. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of, great, of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles, and prophets by the Spirit. So Paul is saying, there was a mystery. There is a mystery. There is something that was not clearly just articulated so that everybody at a glance would immediately understand it. He said, but now, now, he said, by the Spirit, God has articulated this mystery to who? He said, through his prophets and apostles. This is why the authority of the apostles is so necessary. This is why we must believe what the apostles taught us concerning Jesus Christ and who Jesus Christ is and what Jesus Christ did. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? Their authority is indisputable. Paul goes on to say, uh, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. How could the... Gentiles be included in the gospel. How could they? They didn't have the scriptures. They didn't have that foundation.
Jesus said, search the scriptures. These are they which testify of me. Well, the Gentiles didn't have that. Do you follow? That's why Paul said, I'm an apostle that God appointed for the Gentiles, specifically to work with the Gentiles. Why? Because Paul was a Pharisee. He was an expert in the scriptures. Nobody in his writings, Paul took more time to articulate the scriptures so as to clarify doctrine and clarify beliefs and to help the Gentiles understand things that the Jews already had access to. Do you follow what I'm telling you? His whole ministry was about bringing the scriptures to life for the Gentile church. That was Paul's whole, whole ministry. If we are to be approved of God, we must handle the Word of God with great care. We must be able to recognize the two aspects of that which we hold as the Word of God or words from God, as it were. The Old Testament was given to us by means of divine inspiration. This does not mean the Lord spoke every word and the writer penned that which he heard, but rather that the Spirit of the Lord moved upon the writers and inspired them to write those things which they penned. The New Testament writers were anointed to write as the Lord himself had given them unique authority. I've had experiences in my life when I believe with all my heart God has anointed me to write something. I had an instance when I was about 12 years old. We had a man in our community who was a lawyer, a very well-known lawyer, a very wealthy lawyer. His wife was found dead in their swimming pool. It was determined that she had been drowned, purposely drowned. She'd been murdered. This man, the attorney, wound up in trial. He was tried for murder. The jury found him guilty. The judge did something that is almost unheard of. He literally stepped in and said, No, you, the jury, have come to the wrong conclusion. You have drawn the wrong verdict. I am going to override that verdict, and I am going to set this man free. He's innocent. I'll never forget it as long as I live. There was such a hubbubaloo in the community. This man, the attorney, went to a local restaurant after he was declared innocent. He went to a local restaurant, had a big party with his friends and family, you know, celebrating him being acquitted. And the restaurant literally wound up closing a few months later because nobody in the community would do business there after this man had had his celebration because everybody believed him to be guilty. Even the jury found him guilty. Everybody felt like, no, there had to be something crooked going on. This man was a wealthy attorney. He probably knew this judge. This judge probably knew him. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? Something went on here that should not have gone on. And I remember one day, I felt led in my spirit. I mean, I, 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 didn't, I can't even describe it. I, I didn't... It was not a passive thing. It, it was like I felt this push, like the Holy Ghost was pushing me. You need to write this man a letter. You need to write this man a letter. I was about 12 years old. So I sat down, Tommy, and I began to write him a letter. I didn't accuse him of anything. I didn't stand because that wouldn't have been God. Spirit of accusation is not from God. But I began to write this man a letter, and I said to him, you know, uh, Mr. Soans, I don't want to use his name or anything, but I said, you know, uh, my name is Charles Morrow, and I live in Beacon Falls, and blah, 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 I don't care. And I said, you know, I just feel like God wanted me to sit down and write you this little note. I said, and I need to tell you that nobody knows what happened with your wife. Nobody knows. I said, but God does. And I just feel like God wanted me to remind you and to tell you 
that one day you're going to stand in front of him. And whatever the truth is, you're going to answer to God for what really happened. And that's basically all I said in my little note, my little letter. And I told my mother about it. We found his address and we sent him this letter. A couple months later, we were in church and my mother comes to me and she says, CJ, CJ, look at, the, look at the back of the church. Look, do you see that tall man standing by the door there? I said, yes. She said, do you know who that is? I said, no. She said, that is so-and-so. Mm -hmm. It was that attorney. I walked to the back of the building and I said, Sir, you know, I'm Chuck Morrow. He said, You're the fellow that wrote me that letter. And I said, Yes, sir, I am. He said, Well, I want to thank you for writing that to me. Now, I don't know if he ever made his peace with God. I don't know what all transpired. But there are times when God anoints you to write something. Maybe hearing those words from a little 12-year-old kid made a difference to him. Do you follow what I'm saying? Maybe it didn't. There are times when God anoints us to write. I believe that the apostles were anointed to write when they wrote. They didn't just sit down and write off a letter, you know, and, and, and didn't put prayer into it, didn't put thought into it, didn't want the Spirit of God to use them in the writing. Do you follow what I'm saying? No, I believe that there was certainly the operation of the Holy Ghost in the writing of the New Testament, but... The New Testament bears an authority for the church so that we cannot afford to shirk its authority and believe something it does not teach or embrace something it does not tell us to embrace or teach something it does not teach. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? That is why we are a one God, Jesus name, apostolic church because we believe in and embrace the authority of the apostles. If the apostles didn't preach it, neither do I. If the apostles didn't teach it, neither do I. Mm -hmm. If we're to be approved of God, we must handle the Word of God with great care. We must recognize that the Word of God are words from God. The Old Testament given by divine inspiration, the New Testament bearing apostolic authority. The New Testament writers were anointed to write as the Lord Himself had given them unique authority. Now listen, authority does not guarantee perfection. But it does demand obedience and compliance. If the local authorities create a law or issue an edict, that law must be obeyed. Even if it is unjust or even if it makes no sense, we still must obey that law. Why? Because the authorities tell us this is the law. And they have the authority then to, uh, to enforce that law. If the local authorities create a law or an edict, that law must be obeyed even if it's unjust. Why? Because it has the authority behind it given by the Constitution or a local charter. We adhere to the teachings of the apostles as they alone were given the authority to establish the foundation of the church of Jesus Christ. No one since then has possessed this same authority. And for this reason, no changes to their teachings are permissible or acceptable. We know this because of what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 12, 28. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. In Ephesians 2, 19 through 20, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, this is Paul writing again to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews. But fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation 
of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. In Matthew 16, 17 through 19, the Lord told Peter that he was going to be an integral part of the foundation of the church. He And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven this was the Lord promising Peter you're going to be an integral stone in the foundation of the church. The apostles had this unique authority. Whatever they bind on earth, whatever they say, whatever they establish is binding. Just like we use the term binding contract. It's binding. It's established. You cannot break it. He said, and whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. He said, what if, if you say something's okay, then it's okay. Period. I'm giving you the authority. Whatever you say, whatever you... Of course, now he knows the Holy Ghost is going to be working with the apostles, you know. But he gave them this unique authority. Galatians 1, 7 through 9, my last scripture for the day. Paul writes, Which is not another. He's speaking of those who have polluted the gospel of Christ. He said, Which is not another. But there be some that trouble you, and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, the whole Mormon belief system is based on a meeting that Joseph Smith claims to have had with an angel who is never mentioned in the Bible, who has an Italian name, Moroni. But the Apostle Paul said to the church in Galatia, he said, but though we, who's he speaking of? The apostles. Or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. So Paul says, even if I change my message, what you have already heard is set in stone. That's what Paul's saying. He said, what, what we have already delivered to you is the truth. He said, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have received. He said, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, then that which ye have received, let him be accursed. This ministry today is unapologetically apostolic. We understand the church of Jesus Christ is built upon a rock-solid and steady foundation, which consists of the inspiration of prophets, and the authority of apostles. Am I telling the mm -hmm. truth? We seek to strictly adhere to their teachings as to do so allows for us to one day stand before the Lord and hear the word approved. Hallelujah. Would you stand on me this afternoon? Praise the name of the Lord.